guys. Today I want to talk to you about charting. Uh, and charting is a way for women to track their reproductive cycles and reproductive health. Uh, I was asked to share more about this when I talked about my preconception journey in my first trimester recap when I announced my pregnancy. Um, Oh gosh, it's just about a month ago now, uh, and I thought I would go ahead and do that before I get into anything. I want it to be like redundantly clear, <laughs> like not even just abundantly clear, but redundantly clear that I am not an expert in this at all. I'm not a certified health professional or, you know, charting expert or guide or any of that. I'm just simply going to share with you in this video what I did in the last few years to kind of help me get a sense of my reproductive health and also kind of help me really keep track of it and really understand what was going on with my body and be able to know what it needed better. And charting really did do those things for me. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just talk about those things today. But again, if you want more information, I highly recommend going to a source, especially this book, which I'll talk about in a minute, which helped me a lot learn about not only how to chart, but also just all about the female body and system and reproductive health that even in multiple years of health class and in school when I was a kid, you know, growing up, I didn't learn this stuff and it, it should be, every, every woman should, should learn this stuff and it's just not taught really in a all-encompassing way. So I would highly recommend that. Also, you can find charting specialists if you would like, you know, help from a person and you can also talk to your doctor about it. So I would, I would encourage you, strongly encourage you to do all of those things um, if you're going to um, look into charting for yourself. It's very easy. It really literally takes two minutes a day to keep up with um, and it's just a matter of getting in the habit of it. And just like anything, once you start doing it every day, after a couple of weeks, it becomes almost second nature. Now I charted um, about six years ago for a year um, when I went off the birth control pill the first time and wanted to kind of get a sense of things. So I already had some practice going into it, um, but then I started charting again a couple of years ago when we started really actively trying to conceive and at that time I read this book kind of as I was gearing up um, to uh, for preconception. And this is the Taking Charge of Your Fertility, The Definitive Guide to Natural Birth Control, Pregnancy Achievement, and Reproductive Health by Toni Weschler. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, but <laughs> this is the book. I will link it for you below. You can get it at Amazon. I'm sure they sell it at other places too. It actually comes with a um, some software that you can do charting on your computer. I, I prefer to do charting um, by hand because I am that kind of person that when I write something down, it just kind of makes a bigger impact for me. But there are apps for charting. There are computer software for charting. There are different kinds of charts that you can download and print or make yourself or photocopy or whatever. I actually didn't use the chart um, copy that they have in the back of this book because I found that I like the chart in the back of this book instead. This is The Garden of Fertility by Katie Singer. It's another wonderful book. I actually didn't read this entire book because that first one I showed you was pretty all-encompassing and I felt like I kind of got everything that I needed to from there. I just kind of like cross-referenced some points in this book, um, but I didn't read it quite as thoroughly. What I liked about this book, and this is the chart I actually photocopied and blew up a little bit and then continued to use is it had low it included low temperatures it went all the way down to 96.9 and I tended to run pretty like pretty cool my average temperature was 97.3 um, when I was in my follicular phase, and that's before you ovulate, um, which is kind of lower, a little bit lower, and that's something that I worked on um, over the years with my um, acupuncturist, but that's why I picked this chart. I also found like it was just clear and easy to read, so I actually photocopied it and just blew it up a little bit, um, and I'm gonna put it down and, and uh, give you guys like an overhead look at it. Okay, so here you can see I mean, in the book, where, where did that go? You know, I just, I don't know what I blew it up by, maybe like 25% or 30% or something. Um, and then I would just photocopy a copy every month, so I would always have like a blank one for the next month. Um, and this is, 
I mean, this is pretty straightforward information that they give you right here on on the chart. So um, at the top, you write down what fertility cycle number it is if you're keeping track. Um, so that starts from when you started charting. So you know, whenever that was, write the start date. And then when you're done with that cycle, when you get your period, and that's when the cycle is done, um, you write in the number of days. So the top, it has a one through 41 cycle days. And um, then it has a spot for you to write the date to mark if you had intercourse or not, um, to mark the time that your temperature was taken, which is important. And temperature count, your waking temperature, you circle and then connect the dots to make into a chart. Um, you'll, you'll see in a second, it makes like a, a little graph. Um, and then below here, cycle day, so it, it counts it for you. Cycle day one is the first day of your period. Um, so that's when a new cycle starts. And then the last day is the day before your next period. Um, peak day, another thing I didn't use, it's to mark off when you're, when you're most fertile, um, which some people can tell better than others. Um, I didn't use that, I'll go into that in a minute when I show you my own charts. Vaginal sensation, um, that means if you felt just dry or moist. Basically, <laughs> those are the two options, you just mark that down. Cervix has three little places, um, it has three little pictures you can see, a closed dot in the bottom, a middle dot that's a little bit open, and then a full, fully open circle that's kind of towards the top. And that's to check the position of your cervix. If it's low and closed, um, you know you're not fertile. Um, as it opens up and gets higher is when you get more fertile. So that's a way to keep track of that. And then below that has FMS. That stands for firm, medium, or soft. So that's actually like how your cervix feels if it's kind of very hard to the touch, then it's, you're probably not in a fertile period. Kind of medium, you're getting there. Soft, usually is when your cervix is as open as it's gonna get, and you're the most fertile. Now here you'll see mucus. Mucus is such a pleasant word, isn't, isn't it? I think I like to think of it more as cervical fluid, and in fact, um, Weschler talks about calling it fluid, I think, instead of mucus. Um, but that's where you you use women, this is a natural part of being a woman. You have stuff that comes out of you. Um, sometimes every day, sometimes not. It kind of depends on the woman and it depends on the time of your cycle. Um, so just keeping track of that is actually a really great way to look for signs of ovulation. And also just to keep track of your fertile health because there are changes in your cervical mucus, cervical fluid, whatever you want to call it, can indicate you know, an, an issue or not. Um, so it's either, you know, you're either flowing, so you have like period flow, and then I would keep track of like how heavy my flow was and stuff like that. Um, or you would have dry, a dry period sometimes, or you'd have like a sticky period, a creamy period, period of egg white, which is usually when you're most fertile, and egg white is kind of when that when a long stretchy stuff comes out of you. It's not, it's not hard, you know, it's kind of just like, gooey, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and then it kind of cycles back to dry and then it can cycle back to a period if you're gonna get your period. And then down here, it just reminds you again what cycle day is. BSC means breast self exam. It just reminds you to do that on the seventh day of your cycle every month. And miscellaneous was a place that I kept track of you know, similar things on a daily basis, like headaches, stomach problems, exercise, water intake, if I had taken my vitamins, just to kind of keep track of those sort of things, and anything um, extra, and I'm gonna go into that in a second. So this was, this is basically what you track on a daily basis, right? It seems like a lot of information, and it seems like this would be really complicated and time consuming. I guarantee you it is neither of those things. Uh, I've done it I've done it for years. I plan to do it again um, postnatal, even just to keep track and just keep on top of my health. It's also really great if you're trying to conceive to kind of get a better picture because there's a lot that you're in the dark about. Um, you can't just look inside your body and be like, oh, I've just ovulated. Oh, I know this. I mean, it's hard to know unless you actually pay attention and your body gives you all of these natural signs. You don't need, um, you don't necessarily need like other things like ovulation predictor kits and all this jazz to, to figure these things out. Those can be helpful for some people in certain situations for sure. Um, I actually never used an ovulation predictor kit. I didn't feel like I needed to because I had such a firm grasp on when I was gearing up to ovulate and I knew exactly kind of, well not exactly, I knew 
more or less when I would ovulate um, and then I would be able to track that track post ovulation my luteal phase and know if I was pregnant or not before you would even necessarily take a pregnancy test um, so this book really taught me all of that information and I really really highly recommend it um, I can't recommend it enough. It really spells things out really well for you and it goes through all sorts of reproductive issues and concerns and ways to address them. It's great. So I'm actually going to show you a couple of my own charts. Um, I have charts dating back, you know, like I said, I actually kept them all in this little folder, dating back from when we, um, you know, first started to like actively try. So my first fertility cycle was in June of 2013 that I tr charted. And you can see this is like a huge chart. It's two, I had to um, tape together two pages. It was a 57 day cycle. Yes, my cycles were that long before. Um, I got them down to about an average of 37, um, which is still like about a week longer, a uh, week to 10 days longer than what is considered like average or normal. But that was my average, that was my normal. And it can fluctuate per from woman to woman not every woman ovulates smack dab on day 14 that just doesn't happen for everybody um so it's you know charting was a way for me to figure that out and i really use charting as a very important tool to help me figure out what was normal for me how i needed to get there and i could really see the progress as i was doing it so i'm going to show you two charts I'm going to show you one from cycle 13, which was October of last year, and then from cycle 18, which was from um, the end of March this year, and that was the cycle that I conceived in, where I had my BFP, otherwise known as your big fat positive, positive pregnancy test. So first of all, let's take a closer look at the cycle from last fall. Here you can see me going through the days, marking off every day. And I did this using colored pens. Just helps me visually to organize better, like in my mind, color coding really works for me. So I wrote down what cycle number it was, I wrote down the date, and then at the end of the cycle, I wrote down how many days were in that cycle. So every day, every morning, uh, I would write in the date, I would write in the time that I took my temperature. Now, I took my temperature as soon as I woke up every morning, before I got out of bed, before I really moved at all. So I had my little thermometer on the side of my bed. The thermometer I have is by BD Digital. I think that's what it's called. It's no longer available. But you can get whatever, it's called a basal body temperature is what you're taking. It's your, your resting body temperature after you've been sleeping. Um, and that's just the most consistent way to track. You generally want to take that at this around the same time every day, but I don't necessarily wake up at the same time every day. I generally wake up within an hour of the same time every day, um, and that worked just fine for me. And you can see little fluctuations and things. That's going to happen um, depending on th other things that are going on with you, um, how much sleep you've gotten, if you're sick, um, anything like that. But the general pattern you can kind of see. Uh, so take my temperature right away. That was, the, that was all I did in the morning. And then I picked a specific time of day that I would check my cervical position um, and any, you know, kind of like mucus and all that stuff. And for me, I did that right before bed because you want to do that, uh, the cervical position at least, right around the same time every day. Um, so after I would take my temperature, I'd just circle in what it was. So this was 97.7 on day one which was the first day of my period. And then on um, the period days, I would just write a little asterisk for a, if I was having a flow or an asterisk in a parentheses, if I was just having a spotty kind of day. Uh, and then I'd write down what kind of flow it was, if I had any clotting, and then I'd fill in my miscellaneous information down here. So when, when, you, when you're flowing, there's really no point in checking your cervix. And there's really, I mean, your mucus is is your period. So that's what you're checking. So I did not check my cervix while I was flowing. I generally started checking it when I started going from flow to spotting. Some people have a flow that goes right to nothing. Some people flow and then spot for a while. You know, everybody's different. This is just kind of the way that I found worked best for me. And how, the, I mean, I'm going to get a little graphic here, so bear with me. But how I found the best way to check my cervical position was to squat 
and then just insert a finger. You know, it's your body. You're allowed to put things in it, <laughs> especially if it's for health reasons. I feel a little ridiculous, but I would just stick a, you know, check with a finger, um, and I would just check for firmness, like how firm it was, and positioning. And at first, it takes like a couple of months to kind of get the hang of what it feels like when it's different, because it feels kind of the same most of the time until you start doing it every day for a while, and you can start to really notice the differences. Um, so after about a couple of months, I felt like I could really tell when it was low and firm, or kind of meet in the middle and a little bit softer and then when it was really high and open that's when you're the most fertile so that's a really good way of checking especially if you know your your fertile if your cervical fluid isn't as indicative sometimes it's not for some people sometimes it's not as cut or dry and sometimes people's temperatures are all over the board especially if you're kind of working towards um, reproductive health from coming from some issues that you may or may not even be aware of uh, the temperature can't always be like the most reliable thing so it's really a three-step process. You're doing the temperature, the cervical position, and the mucus. You can do just one of those. Um, most people just do the temperature if they're only gonna do one. I really, really, really recommend doing all three. It takes literally two minutes total a day. Yes, it might seem like a little awkward at first, especially if you're not extremely comfortable with your body, but you will grow to become more comfortable with yourself. You'll grow to know so much more about how your body works. It's not dirty or wrong or anything to to learn those things about yourself um, and to take you know matters into your own hands, for lack of a better word, um, because, I mean, if any, nobody should know your, nobody can know your body more than you can. No doctor or anybody, no matter how often you see them, can know your body more than you. And the more the time you take to actually learn about yourself and learn how you function, the better. Okay, so anyway, um, here you can see um, kind of like a regular, you know, a cycle for me last year. And so, you know, kind of floating along, um, by the time that I got to my fertile window, which is about five days before you ovulate, the thing about taking your temperature is it cannot predict when you will ovulate. It can only confirm that you have. So you will be able to confirm you have ovulated for the most part, um, if your temperatures follow a healthy pattern, um, post ovulation. So that's really just a confirmation. What can help you predict is the cervical position and the cervical mucus. So what happens is, like I said, for your, first, for your follicular phase, for the first half of your follicular phase, you're flowing, right? You have your period. Then you have kind of a dry period, and this is when your cervix is really low and firm, and you're not really producing a lot of cervical mucus. Then you kind of start amping up. For me, that was, you know, a little bit of stickiness. The cervix moved up a little, got a little bit softer, but not really that open yet. Um, you can just kind of see how it, how it kind of progressed. Um, and you just have a kind of a wetter vaginal sensation in general. When you get into your fertile window, you know it because your cervix gets very high, very open, very soft, and your cervical mucus should also kind of build. Now again, this can be different for every woman. For me, it was really indicative that I was entering my fertile window when I had what they call egg white consistency, um, cervical mucus, and that's this kind of clear, almost a little bit stretchy, like you can actually stretch it between your fingers and the stretcher it is, the more fertile it is, so you can kind of measure that. Um, that's something that, that uh, what's her face, Tracy? Tony recommends in her book, um, which I did as well because it, I really did find that it correlated. Um, and then during those days, you can kind of, you know, kind of know that you're in your fertile window and if you're trying to conceive, that's when you really, you know, you really go for it. <laughs> and then after about five or six days of that, if your temperature is following a healthy pattern, it will spike. And once it's spiked, it means you have already ovulated. Once your temperature has gone up, the jig is up for that month. Like if you've conceived, you've conceived. If you haven't, you haven't. Um, for me, the temperature spiking was just a confirmation that, okay, I had passed 
ovulation and I was now in my luteal phase. And in your luteal phase, your temperature will stay elevated until it comes back down for your next cycle. Or if you're pregnant, it will continue to stay elevated. And they say that if, you're, if your temperature is elevated past ovulation in your luteal phase for 18 days or longer, then you are most certainly pregnant. Um, for me, if it was longer than 15 days, I was most certainly pregnant because my temperature, like clockwork, came down around day 11 or 12 of my luteal phase only. Um, so that's what I would count in the temperature count section was my luteal phase, how long that was. Because that is something to, uh, to be mindful of and to track um, for optimal fertility health. Um, because a short luteal phase or a very long luteal phase can affect your reproductive health. Um, and it's just really good information to have. Um, so that's when I would start counting. And you'll see this little shaded in circles. That was, that was how I kept track of the fertile window before my ovulation. Now again, this was something that I filled in post ovulation, but I knew just from the cervical mucus and the cervical um, positioning and you know firmness that I was in the window or not. I hope this is making sense because it's a little confusing to explain, but it's really straightforward once you start doing it. So I would always mark my day of ovulation um, because I just like to keep track of that. Actually, I marked, yeah, and with, for me, the day of ovulation is always the day before the temperature spiked. Um, that's just how I would mark it because, you know, once your temperature spikes, you have already ovulated. So I would just like to keep track of that so I would knew what you know that that was consistent um, for me around a day 22 was very average uh, for ovulation like I said they teach you in school or whatever that 14 is when girls ovulate well not all girls ovulate on day 14 for me a day 22 ovulation was actually perfectly normal and healthy and I was able to conceive that way and then when I got my period I would also mark that with a square just so it would just be easy to point out and then be like, okay, well I had a 35 day cycle because I got my period on the 36th day. That means I had to start a new chart. So the, the cycle was 35 days long. Um, the other thing that I did to kind of keep track, you can keep track of your, I think they call it your baseline temperature, or your midline, I can't remember, but it's, um, I don't know if that's worth going into. That's definitely detailed in that book there. You can definitely look that up if you want. It's just a way to kind of see what your average is um, in any given cycle and to make sure that's kind of staying somewhat consistent. Um, so that's something you can do. So the other part of the chart that I did, that's kind of optional, I guess, but I was just really interested in my health and my general health and how it played into my reproductive health as well. So I kept track of uh, my water intake, my exercise um, routines, my vitamin, you know, I would check off if I took my vitamins every day, what kind of energy level I had on a scale from one to 10. Um, ick was just kind of like generally not feeling well. Stum stummy, I, these are my own little like names for things. It's just like belly aches, stomach issues, headache, if I had headaches or not. And then miscellaneous, I would write in during my, um, during my cycle, I mean during my period, I would write in how bad my cramps were and then past I'd be like bloating or any back pain or, or any anxiety or anything like that that I just wanted to keep track of that I felt made an impact on my reproductive health. And so I kept track of that, but really it was this part of the chart that was really all I needed to kind of really get a good sense of my reproductive health. This was just kind of like bonus. So now if we move over to here to the 18th fertility cycle that started in March, um, you can see this was the cycle I conceived in. And again, I ovulated on day 22. So that is the day that I technically conceived. Now sperm can live in your vagina for up to five days. Um, so it's possible that you're, the sperm that um, fertilizes the egg has been in your body for longer than just that day. It's very likely, actually, because um, sperm can live a long time, and it's a rather ch tough journey for the sperm to get to the egg. But you don't actually conceive until the sperm fertilizes the egg and the egg is released in ovulation. Um, so that you always know when you've conceived, if you've been charting and keeping track, because you know when you ovulated last. So you know that's the date. That's 
that's when you conceived. Um, so you can see it followed the same pattern here. Um, and it spiked off on day 23, so I knew I had ovulated on day 22. And um, it went up, it went up, and then it never came down. And by day, I think it was day 15, by day 14, and the temperature hadn't gone down, like I said, my luteal phase was always kind of 12 days on the money, 12 or 13 in this case, but it was normally 12 days. Anything longer than that was like, okay, I'm probably pregnant. So by day 14, I was like, okay, it's, my temperature is still high. If it's still high the next day, on day 15 of my luteal phase, then I will take a pregnancy test. And I did, and I was pregnant. And I kind of, I mean, it, it was surprising, but it was also like, I knew that, I knew it was a very, very strong possibility based on just knowing my body so well from this process. Um, so let me just go over a few basic things again because I feel like I just said a lot of things and it maybe wasn't as well organized as I had hoped, but the first half of your cycle, which includes, so your cycle starts on the first day of your period, and the first half of your cycle goes up to your day of ovulation. So that's mid-cycle. That's called your follicular phase and you can Read all about what, why it's called that in those books if you want. I'm not going to go into all the medical details. Then you ovulate, and after ovulation, for the remainder of your cycle, you're in your luteal phase. And that is when your temperature should be elevated, um, and then it will come back down when you're kind of winding down for a new cycle. And if you're pregnant, the temperature will stay up, and you will not start a new cycle. Technically, it's the same cycle when you're pregnant until your next period. I think. I think so. Anyway, that was sort of my rundown of charting. This was probably a really long video. Um, and I hope this was helpful to some of you who are asking. Again, this is just my experience with charting. This is what I have done and will continue to do. Um, I actually still take my temperature every day just because I want to stay in the habit of it. Um, and it's so easy. It just takes a few minutes. I mean, not even a few minutes. It takes a few seconds. Um, and it just kind of helps me keep track of, like, if I'm not getting enough sleep, it'll dip a little, or if I'm getting, you know, whatever. Um, but uh, I hope this was helpful to you. I Again, I really recommend looking for a, a all-encompassing source like this book or even this one. One. If you want more information, there are specialists who will consult with you on charting if you need more help. Um, it, it seems a little daunting, I know, at first, and even when you're reading these books, you're like, this seems like a lot to do. But once you start doing it and see and see for yourself, it's really only a couple minutes a day, and it provides a wealth of information. I mean, just so much amazing information about your body and your health that is totally accessible and free to you and easy to get. Um, and it's just, I really think this is something that we should teach young women, but we don't. So um, hopefully you guys can figure out if this is something you want to do for you. Even if you're not planning on con you know, trying to conceive or anything, I just think it's a really good thing to get in the habit of doing. Just to know how you are, know how your body works, and know how your health is, where your health is at. Anyway, I hope you found this helpful. Um, you can head on over to my blog post where I'll have um, kind of better, crisper pictures of my charts so you can kind of see by example what I've done and links to these books and things and more information on different phases and stuff. But um, thank you guys for watching. I hope, I hope this was informative. Um, again, remember, not an expert, just sharing what I did. And I will see you guys uh, in a couple of days for an uh, update. So thank you for watching and I'll see you real soon. Take care, you guys. Bye.